right, welcome everyone to the All Points North Lodge Speaker Series. We're so excited to have you here with us today. My name is Emily and I'm on the marketing team here at APN Lodge. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, while we're waiting for people to join, I'll tell you a little bit more about us. This is the APN Lodge Speaker Series, which is an initiative that we've started to bring mental health, trauma, and addiction resources to you as an inspiration and awareness. All Points North Lodge is a behavioral health company specializing in addiction treatment, mental health, and trauma therapy. And we have a beautiful campus located in the Rocky Mountains of Edwards, Colorado, and we offer telehealth therapy as well as we just opened a detox and assessment center just outside of Denver, Colorado. So I'd like to take a minute to give a shout out to our alumni, telehealth clients, therapists, and our clients who may be listening to this now in our media room at the lodge. We're all um, honored to have you all here. Also, please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A and use the chat. You can change your name on Zoom to protect your privacy. <clears throat> and so every month we have a special guest join us. And today that's Brittany Young, who will be talking about how acceptance is the answer. She's an international speaker, published author, and um, certified as an executive NLP practitioner, emotional intelligence life coach, and Reiki master. So I will go ahead and hand it over to Brittany. Hello, everyone. Happy Thursday. I'm going to share my screen with you all and share my slides. And we're definitely going to be talking about acceptance being the answer here today. But before we get started with presentation, I wanted to take us through a guided visualization meditation. And we have a poll for you all. We're gonna start out with questions, give you about 30 seconds, figure out where everyone is. So who here has done guided meditation before? Um, go ahead and answer the poll now. Yes, I have, this is my first time, or no, this is not my favorite, but I will participate in the guided meditation. And what I'm going to do is walk you through a garden in this meditation and um, take you through very many visuals to see um, how your brain reacts to all of that and paying attention to what you start to see. So I'm gonna give you about 10 more seconds here to answer that poll. All right, let's wrap it up. We've got five, four, three, two, and one. Y'all have answered it. So yes, I have. Some of you, this is your first time. And some of you have said, this is not your favorite, but I will participate. Okay. So the way we get started with guided meditation. First, we want to make sure that we're free of any distractions. Nothing's on our lap, phones our side, um, anything that can possibly be in our visual, want to shut that down um, and just be present with your normal breathing, planting your feet firmly on the floor. Um, I don't care where you place your hands. I usually like to place them on my heart or on my belly and just to see, engage where my breath is and how I'm feeling. So if you're coming to this a little bit full of anxiety or depression or feeling some sort of way, really be mindful of where your breath is. And we're just normally breathing. And I want you to really think about being here now, being present if you decided to join this today be here now with me and let my voice guide you on this journey through our garden. I'm gonna close my eyes. I'm gonna place my right hand on my heart and my left hand on my belly. And we're just gonna take some deep breaths together, breathing in for four 
and then breathing out for four. So let's go ahead and start with breathing in and breathing out. And in and out. One more breath in and out. Any thoughts, anything that is coming up? We want to thank it for being present and ask it to kindly be stored away for right now. So we can concentrate in on our breath and in on our journey. And we're going to begin. So we're gonna to walk together to a house. And the house is brick. The front door is black and we're going to walk through that door together. So go ahead and unlock the front door, which has a golden handle and step into the home. And in the home, you're going to see three separate rooms in front of you. We're going to go into the room all the way over to the right. In that room, there will be three doors one green door, one white door, and an elevator door. We're gonna walk over to the green door and you're going to open that green door. Peek through and just leave the door open and step back. Walk over to the white door, same thing. Open it, peek through, and then step back. And then we're going to get into the elevator together and we're going to go down three floors. So go ahead and step in, press the button to go down three, three, two, two, one, one. And the door opens and now we're in the basement. In front of us is a red door with a golden handle. We're gonna open that door, walk through, and in front of you is a red carpet. You're gonna walk down that red carpet to a giant, beautiful gold chair where you see an old gentleman wearing a crown. He offers you to sit down in his chair and he places the crown on your head. Now this gentleman represents someone in your life whom you love very, very deeply. It could be your father, your grandfather, an uncle, a brother. Have some words with them, say hello, thank them for putting this crown on your head. And as this crown is being placed on your head, you start to envision in your mind's eye, a secret pathway that leads to a secret garden. So you decide to get on this path and you're walking down this path, looks like a sidewalk to another door. And as you open this door, it is full of that secret garden. Beautiful lush trees, flowers, golden roses, lilies, sunflowers sprouting out of the ground above your head. The grass is lusciously green. And you continue walking down the path. And as you're walking, all of these different flowers, plants start sprouting out of the ground and into your vision. Flying by you right now is a butterfly. 
It's orange and has black spots. And it's circling around you as you continue walking down this path. And you find a bench and you decide to sit down on that bench. And on that bench, you invite your higher self into this conversation, into this visualization, and into this garden. And your higher self starts to speak to you and sharing with you some wisdom, some things that they've seen for your future. Let them speak now and visualize what they look like, what they smell like, what they're wearing. And just take a moment and listen. It is time for them to go now and you say goodbye. And we are going to walk down the path once more. And this time we're gonna go back through the red door. So as the flowers continue to grow around you, the grass continues to sprout through the the ground. Notice the red door off to the left hand side. I want you to walk towards the door, grab onto the golden handle and walk through, back down the red carpet, and hand the older gentleman back his crown and give him permission to sit back down into his seat. And you and I meet after you walk back to the red carpet down to the door again, you and I meet in the basement. We're gonna go back up the elevator, one, one, two, two. Three, three, out of that room, back into the hallway, and we're gonna walk out the front door and walk out of the house and say goodbye to our garden, bye to the older gentleman, and bye to the home, and you can go ahead and open your eyes. So in the chats, chat my friends, I'd love to know what you saw in your garden. What did your higher self say to you? What kind of flowers did you see? Who was that older gentleman? And what did you get out of this guided meditation? Go ahead and type in the chat. I want to make this as interactive as possible so you're not staring at me this whole time and listening to my voice. Um, we're going to make this as interactive as we possibly can. Really vibrant colors, beautiful. I'd love to know what colors you saw. I saw a lot of yellows and orange and gold and, and felt a lot of warmth rush through my body as I was in that garden and sitting next to my higher self. Anyone else? What did you see? What did you feel? Yellow sunflowers with bright green leaves. Gorgeous. I love that. Um, one of my favorite flowers are sunflowers and how, how beautiful they are when they grow above us. So go ahead and continue typing in the chat. Felt a lot of peace. My higher self was really calm and confident, much more calm and confident than I feel right now. Beautiful.
Thank you for sharing that, my friend. And confidence is a big thing that, you know, we are facing as, as a whole. And I would say definitely over the last two years um, during this time, which we find ourselves in. So you can continue typing in the chat, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about who I am. Who is this woman and why is she talking to us? <laughs> um, I am, first of all, a woman of love, a woman of um, universal hope, truth, and faith. Um, definitely believe in, in a higher power, a wife, a mom, and I have two dogs. I spent 15 years of my career thus far in the pharmaceutical industry and sales, and then moved over to chemical sales for a little bit before starting my own company in 2017. When I started my company, I became a personal trainer and a health coach. And within a year that quickly transitioned into doing international speaking, and coaching, mentoring businesses, and women specifically who are looking to get into business. Um, and this year, I wrote a chapter in a multi-authored book and a foreword for a best-selling book. So both became bestsellers. Um, and I also received my international emotional intelligence certification as well as NLP training. And I help other professionals such as myself and those that are in business for themselves to dominate their own particular industry by mastering their emotions, their emotional intelligence, which helps them create wealth in all areas of their life. And Brian says, higher self told me to love, value and honor others wherever they are in their own garden's growth. That my friends, is fantastic. And thank you for sharing, Brian, about value and honor in others, because we're going to be talking about that a lot in this presentation here tonight. So just because all these accomplishments, it wasn't always this way. I have not always been this stellar individual that I find um, myself, where I'm at now and where I'm going and who I'm becoming. Um, life wasn't always this way. Um, just going back to the chat, lavender, yellow, white flowers, peace and happiness, reconnected with oldest friend. Um, saw a woman who was not as fortunate as I am today and who are gone but left me empowered to help others and myself. Thank you for sharing that, Lillette. I love that. Thank you so much. So I'm going to share a little bit about my story and um, my overall story and the journey of where I was to where I'm at. And so my story begins in my teens. Um, and if any of you can relate, go ahead and let me know as I'm talking how you relate to this story and what comes up for you as I'm speaking. I, I started my, my drinking career at 17. I really wanted to be recognized for someone to see me. It's not that I had a difficult childhood, but a lot of it felt like I'm the oldest of four and recognition really wasn't there. I had to play mom and a lot of, um, certain situations, especially with my younger sister, who's 14 years younger than I am. I had a car seat in the car by the age of 16, driving her around um, with me. So drinking became an outlet, something that I enjoyed doing. And unfortunately, during my drinking career um, at 17, what really kind of propelled it into where it went was being sexually assaulted by a friend of mine. And 
the next day after that happened, he called and said, we're not gonna speak of this. No one needs to know that this occurred. And I carried that around, a lot of that guilt and that shame for about 14 years of my life until I, I finally told a sponsor of mine that this happened to me. I never shared it with family. I never shared it with friends. And it led me to become an alcoholic by 18. Most alcoholics don't realize that they become an alcoholic within the first six months to a year of drinking. Um, it is scientifically proven that this does occur within us and within our genes and our gene makeup. So I knew I had a problem at 18, but I didn't fully recognize it until I was about 20, 21, and I had turned into a full-blown alcoholic. Um, I walked onto my basketball team at uh, the age of 18. I decided, you know, I'm going to go to this particular school. I'm going to play ball and I'm going to get my degree. And um, I decided to walk on to the basketball team. And by 20, I was kicked off the team for not just my drinking, but for my behavior for the way that I acted around other people and the um, behaviors that were leading me down the wrong path. So I spent most of my college career, um, unfortunately blacking out and unfortunately dealing with um, <clears throat> a lot of issues where rumors were spread about me. And um, despite all of those stories and odds, I kept going. I was a very high functioning alcoholic and I graduated in 2009. So recession hit in 2008. So between 2008 and 2009, companies were not hiring. And I found myself lucky <laughs> to land a job. And because I went to school for pharmaceuticals, I was hired right out of school. And I got a job with the top pharmaceutical company in the world at that time. Now, even though I had this job and I was very fortunate to be one of few people who got hired out of college to pursue a career in this type of environment, my drinking became worse. You know, I was making money. So I figured, well, <clears throat> I can put a lot of my money towards buying a home and doing all these different things, which is great, but I can also party on the weekends. I have that freedom. Um, I moved out uh, after college and, and had that opportunity. So as I was working on my MBA, I also did purchase a home at 23, but my drinking became even worse. And I hit my first bottom in those first, in those couple of years between 23 and 25. And I was also in a very toxic and abusive relationship during that as well. So by 25, I had come back from vacation actually here in Texas. I was visiting a friend and I came back and the director of my department came to my desk and said, you're done. Um, we need you to pack it up and get out of here by Friday. You have two choices. You can fight this or you can leave and it can be amicable. And I was very defensive because I didn't know why I was being let go. I thought that they didn't like me, right? So I just thought, well, they're pushing me out. They're gonna be hiring somebody else that can do my job possibly better, but really it was my drinking. And like I mentioned, that toxic relationship. So that toxic relationship um, ended in, unfortunately, a, a physical assault um, by that gentleman. And that led me to stop drinking for three months. So during that three month period, after I was let go, I thought, you know what, I really need to get my life together here. Um, this is not going the way that I anticipated. This doesn't feel good in my body to go down this path. 
Um, so I, I decided to quit cold turkey. And in doing so, I joined the gym and I thought, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get life back together. It's going to be great. And, you know, as I was doing all of this, I landed a new position and I was super pumped about it. And it felt like this was the way, this was where I was going to go. And um, I'm going to be in sales and I'm going to kick ass in sales. And none of that, <laughs> none of that happened. Um, yes, I had this great job, but after those three months, I started drinking again after a girlfriend called me up to say, let's commiserate over your breakup. And within that first hour of drinking, I had already blacked out. So my second bottom was a two year long struggle with alcohol. And this was the worst of the worst of it all. I was blacking out um, waking up with uh, seizures and sometimes getting very, very sick and ill. And because of all of that, I started losing friends, family. My own mother wanted nothing to do with me. And my father simply said to me, we can't have you around, can't have you around your siblings. During those two years, I spent $30,000 and came very close to losing um, the home that I had purchased. And despite having an $80,000 salary, I was living check to check. Life seemed unmanageable and it was, and I didn't see it at the time. And friends were trying to stage an intervention. Family was trying to get me into a rehab or at least work with um, the pastor of the church to, to help me out. And quite frankly, I wanted nothing to do with any of it. So during those two years, as I was losing people, I was also losing myself. And in the process of losing myself, I hit a bottom so bad that it literally bounced me back into reality. Um, I went out one night and I only decided, you know what, I'm gonna have a glass of wine, that's all. And um, unfortunately, I don't know still to this day what happened, but I woke up and I was in a, a hallway, there was elevator doors and there were two gentlemen standing there with me. And they said, do you know who you are? Do you know where you are? And do you know what happened to you? And I couldn't answer any of the questions. I had gotten sick all down the front of my outfit. I had already called EMTs to come and help me and take me to the hospital. I apparently needed my stomach pumped. Um, I believe I was somewhat coherent because they did lead me back to my friends. And I later found out that I was actually drugged at the bar um, and somehow found my way back to an apartment complex that nobody belonged. Uh, nobody lived there. No, no, I didn't know anybody there, but I stumbled into the wrong one. So that was really the, the bottom of the bottoms. And I remember um, the following weekend when everyone was trying to stage this intervention. I declined and I, I got really defensive and I decided to go to the bar, of course. And I'm sitting at the bar and um, I'm from Philadelphia. And so the Eagles were on TV. It was mid-September, it's preseason and they weren't that good at the time. <laughs> so I'm sitting there and I'm like, oh man, I could really use a beer. So I asked the bartender to, to pour me a beer and I wrung out my father. And I was serious, yet kind of half joking. And I called him and I said, you know, I, I, I really want help. I really do. I, I, I want help and I want you to help me figure this out because I, I know I can't do this by myself. And 
it's been a really weird journey. And his exact words to me were, we've exhausted all help. We, we tried to get you into a facility. We called Pastor Joe to help and see how we can get the church involved. You're denying anyone that's trying to give you what you're asking for. My advice to you, Brittany, is to just stop. And I said, how do you do that? How do you just quit? And on the other end of the phone, he screamed, just stop. And he hung up. And it hit me. I do need to do this for myself, beginning with myself, until I can prove that I can trust myself again. I need to find support and I need to find what's going to help me recover in the best way. So I left the bar. I went back to my home and I broke down and I got on my hands and knees and I just said out loud, if you're out there, please, please help me through this. I don't know where to go. I don't know where to turn. I don't know what life's going to look like, but I need help. And I, I some, somehow, some way decided to pull out my computer and I typed in Google, um, how to get sober on your own. And I came across this story of a gentleman who was a heroin addict and he also performed in the CrossFit games. I forget his name, but he went to the games. He shot up before he got into the race. And if you've ever watched them, it's the most competitive and highly trained athletes that go and compete against one another from all over the world for this title of fittest in the world um, from CrossFit standards. So obviously he <laughs> didn't do so hot and he came in last place <clears throat> and everybody was talking about him. You know, he should have did better. Why didn't he perform well? All these, all these stories kept popping up about him. And I found I was scrolling down, you know, what, are there any positive stories about this person? Is he still alive? And I found one and it said, CrossFitter gets sober and I clicked on it. After he had came in last place, he realized that that was his bottom and his addiction had gotten so bad that he needed heroin in order to even function at the CrossFit games. So what he did, which does not get recommended to anyone anywhere, and I'm not recommending this, and by doctor standards, he didn't recommend this when he was talking in this article. He, he locked himself at home and detoxed as friends and family came in to pray with him and support him on his journey. And he did it by himself. Um, and then he went to a facility to get treatment and um, medication and all the things that he needed. And while he was at treatment, he decided to start a CrossFit community with those around him. So the light bulb went off in my head. What would it look like if I joined such a community? If I joined a support system that made me feel better about myself and didn't judge me for my past and didn't judge me for my body and, and who I was and, and where I'm coming from. So on September 17th, I signed, a, signed up for this class and my journey began on September 18th in 2013. And I walked into this gym and it's called CrossFit King of Prussia in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. 
and there were all these people around in the hallway and they're laughing and they're giggling and it was not serious until I walked in and I must have scared a lot of people because I looked like a ghost and they're looking at me going like oh god who's this is she coming off the street and I said to them hi I have a session this evening my name is Brittany um who is training me this evening who am I supposed to be working with and uh, it, it was as if everyone like cleared out of the room and there was this gentleman sitting at the desk. And I said, I, I don't know who you are, but I think I'm supposed to be working with a man named Tim. And he said, that's me. So I whispered to him and I said, Tim, I'm like not even 24 hours sober. So I'm apologizing in advance if I get sick in your gym if I can't make it through the full workout and if I quit because um, this is really hard for me and I don't know if I'm even supposed to be here. In that moment, it was as if higher power was there and spoke through Tim because Tim said to me, Brittany, I am five years sober. And I know exactly where you're at, where you were, and what you're going to become. Let me help you. And let's go into the gym. So life really began right then and there in that moment. And I spent two and a half years going to this gym, reinventing myself, building back my self-esteem, building back my body. Um, I had put on about 50 plus pounds during my 10 year drinking career. And life didn't look the same in that moment as it had for 10 years. So I still had the same job and I was feeling really good about myself, but I knew I needed a change. And got talking with some people at the gym one day and they said, well, what if it looked like if you relocated and you move somewhere, how does that feel? And I thought, you know what? That feels really good to me to have a fresh start, to get out of Pennsylvania and, and to move into a different place. So I started doing research. Where are people moving? You know, I, I, I loved, um, I love doing research on, on different things. And so where did I want to go? Um, Austin, Texas looked like some, some cool place to be and have music and all these different things. So I lined up a few interviews. I came down here to Texas and talked to a bunch of people. And they said, you know, it's a great place to raise a family. It's a great place to, to live. And, and the economy is doing really well. And lo and behold, there was an opportunity in a different department where I was um, that was accepting sales uh, reps to come in and um, apply for this position. And it wasn't pharmaceutical sales, it was chemical sales. So I'm sitting in the interview and they, the first question that they asked me was, are you willing to relocate? And I said, absolutely, yes. And they said, okay, well, we're giving our applicants a couple of options. How does Los Angeles say, uh, feel for you? I said, I don't know anybody there. And preferably I, because I'm an East Coast gal, I don't think that I'll fit in on the West Coast. Um, I want to move to Texas. And they said, well, you've got Houston or Dallas. And I said, neither of those fit. I'm an Eagles fan. So I can't move to Dallas and that's my only reason. And Houston's too big. I visited, I didn't really like it. So I'm going to move to Austin. And one of the ladies started giggling and she said, this is a girl that knows what she wants. They gave me the, the job um, almost five minutes after the interview and off I went. And um, I had a place lined up. I had somebody renting my place and it felt like things were really moving in order um so 
as it goes on, here I am, I land in Texas, I find a gym that is completely supportive. The coach that's running this gym, he is um, a, a product of recovery and I'm just so blessed to have found him. And as the story goes on, I you know, was in this position for about a year and a half. The company decided to kind of sell off all of his assets because they were about to sell um, the company and 40% of us were let go. And I had a decision to make, do I wanna stay in corporate? And because I'm in sales, it, it can be pretty lucrative, but also pretty toxic. You never know, usually you're the first to go. And so that week that they called me to say, we're shutting down the company and we're selling everything off, um, I had a job offer lined up, but something inside of me said, do it your way, go and figure it out. So here I am. Um, my story is still continuing and I've been sober for eight years now since September of this year. And where I find myself after becoming a personal trainer and evolving it into speaking and coaching and writing, I am what I call an emotional business coach. And I also speak and teach about this whole thing called the permission process. And at the end of the permission process, it's all about accepting who you are and the acceptance as the answer. My main focal points for my life today are my faith, um, being a wife and being a mother. And where I find most enjoyable and fun, especially during the pandemic, has been yoga, meditation, and journaling. And these are some of the things that I like to help my clients with to figure out when you're going through such an emotional time and emotional space, what are some of those modalities that feel really good to your body, feel really nurturing to your soul and keep your mind at ease. And I wanna remind each and every one of you that you're in a beautiful time where your story really is just beginning, that there is no ending to your story. Yes, we all have life to live and we all move on um, from this life, but this is the beginning of the journey. So where are you beginning your journey? And I just want to share this with you because um, I, I'm a big researcher and I love talking about others when it comes to recovery, when it comes to where we were to where we're at now. 14.5 million people just here in the States, starting at the age of 12, are dealing and suffering from alcohol use disorder. I, being one of those people, um, was fortunate enough to recover. And 1 million out of those 14.5 have received treatment. Now the numbers are um, not out yet for this year as to how many people have received treatment, but this is a study done um, from 2019 that I found on the um, alcoholic, it's alcohol, tobacco and firearms website. Alcohol contributes to about 18.5 of, um, that should say ER visits, and 22.1% of overdose deaths are related to opioids, just to compare that to how many people are passing away from alcohol. About 95,000 people a year die from alcohol-related incidences, whether it be liver failure, um, <clears throat> getting into a wreck from being drunk behind the wheel, or um, passing away in their sleep from alcohol poisoning or, or getting sick in the middle of the night and unfortunately 
uh, passing away. So why recovery? And why is it so important that we journey down this road? I put together some of the key principles that I have found have really helped me in my recovery process. Number one, this is a holistic approach. So where you're at right now in your journey and on this life path, you get to make it what it is for you. So number two, as you see, it's individual. Um, I chose to go <clears throat> down a very unconventional path and get into weightlifting and bodybuilding and powerlifting. That to me is a holistic approach. And what I did was mind, body, spirit while I was at the gym. Some of us choose treatment. Some of us choose outpatient. Some of us choose to do it on our own. It's up to the individual to decide on what that's going to look like for them. Number three, really building that key support system. I've really had to build back the trust from friends and family because it was lost. I didn't have that. And so really focusing in on who are the key players that are gonna help you get through this time and get through this journey and keep you accountable in ways that you never thought were possible, right? Because number four, we're going to face ups and downs every single day throughout the rest of our life. This year has been one of the hardest years of my life to date. Um, I became a mom last year <clears throat> and I suffered from postpartum depression and anxiety. And that really hit me about the six month to eight month mark after having the baby. So I was facing quite a bit of trials and tribulations through that. Do I continue with my company? Um, do I take time off to nurture myself and, and rest while also raising this child with my partner? Where's life going to take me? And, and thinking that things are happening to me when in reality they were happening for me. I also unfortunately lost a lot of friends this year due to relapse and overdose. Um, that hit me super hard and tested my own recovery. So we're gonna face a lot of those downs and then the ups, facing success. Um, some people see success as almost being a detriment to life. So where's the balance of it all? And then that last piece of recovery has been addressing past and addressing trauma. As I mentioned in the beginning, I faced a sexual assault and I did not look at it honestly until 2017. It scared me to death to look at it. And it happened, you know, 14 years prior. Um, I didn't know the emotions that were gonna come with it. I didn't know what was gonna come about if I was going to have to um, do something about it. So really addressing it in therapy, addressing it with my family, talking about it, being open and honest with where I was and, and the situation that occurred and um, other assaults that I have been through in, in relationships or other sexual assaults that I suffered throughout my drinking. And then the last thing that I wanted to share with you all is the actual permission process that I walk my clients through. Because <clears throat> when we start to learn acceptance, being the answer to, to all of who we are, we're giving ourselves a chance to dig deeper into really what we're made of, that resilience, that makeup. I'm a big, big advocate for men and women speaking their truth, being as completely vulnerable and raw as they possibly can, because I think 
by us sharing who we truly are, we see ourselves in a different way. And it continues to allow us to grow every single day. So the permission process, um, I'm going to walk y'all through this. And if you have um, pen and paper, or if you want to type in the chat as we go, I wanted to make this an interactive um, type of exercise that we can do together. So give you a couple minutes if you want to grab a notebook. And if you just want to go with me here um, through the process and what I will say to you is this is not complicated. And the way that I work through this with my clients is really on an emotional um, level. So when we think about intention, um, if you have ever read any books around law of attraction or manifestation, similar, but intention is really about direct um, telling God, source, higher power, uh, what is it that I truly want and need at this point in time? So I'm going to go with you through this. Let's say uh, you need a new car and you're going to set the intention that by January 30th, you are going to the Hyundai dealership and you're going to pick out a car. And that car is going to be a 2021 model. It's going to be silver. The interior is going to be gray. Um, it's a three seater, three rows um, with plenty of cargo space in the back because you love to hike and you love to take your dogs with you when you go hiking. So we set the intention that we are purchasing a new vehicle and we're gonna do this by January 30th, all right? So the second part is desire. And the way I look desire at is the word want, the word want in the dictionary, it, it you know, you can look up the definition, but the way I view want is something that I'm never gonna have. So I really have trained my brain to believe that desires matter more because desires are something that I can actually go after. Whereas a want is something that I may never get, right? I, I want a Ferrari, but I may never actually get a Ferrari. Now I desire to have that Ferrari and I can picture myself in that, right? driving it around. It's cool. Um, I'm a fast driver. So unfortunately I'd probably get pulled over, but I desire that Ferrari sitting in my driveway and hopping in it just to go to the grocery store. So what is your intention? And the desire behind that, it, it is the, the, the one, right? The, the, what do I need out of that intention? The third thing is making the decision. So we go from asking to believing that we can have what we're asking for to then making the decision, decision solidly within. Yes, I truly desire this thing and I'm going to get it or this is gonna be really difficult and I need to do some processing emotionally around it, right? And what tends to happen is throughout this process, we hit a wall. And a lot of men and women, when they hit that wall, all these emotions start flooding. Oh, I, I, you know, I really, I really did try to get that Ferrari or that Hyundai and, and buy this date and it didn't work. And I'm really disappointed in myself. So we kind of go backtrack and we see, well, what's that disappointment really about? Where did it start in the body? And where's it taking you? So if you get onto that lot and you didn't see what you desired, are you just giving up? Or are you really starting the process of 
actually what I asked for is still being built. And why it's a forgiveness process at step number four is because that disappointment or that resentment or that anger that comes up, we start to see it come into our body and then we start to see it outward, right? Often we're a reflection of what we see. So that's why a mirror is so cool because what others are seeing is what you're seeing as well. So if you start to see yourself as beautiful, intelligent and powerful, that is reflected outward and other people start to see that also. But if disappointment or anger or that resentment kicks in, we need to find out what the root of that all is. And by doing so, we can actually go through the steps of forgiveness. Maybe at the age of seven, you found yourself really disappointed because you desired some sort of Tonka truck and your brother got it for Christmas instead. And you were really, really angry at your parents. So going back to that situation, a little bit of trauma work and really touching on what the key emotions were so that we can allow for your physical body to process through. And once we do that, once we're able to go into forgiveness and really start to love who we truly are, because my friends, there's 19 of you on this and more will be watching. <coughs> You know, like I said, it's been a really difficult year, but this year gave me an opportunity to figure out who Brittany is. So forgiveness allows us to do that. Forgiving parts of who we once were and who we're becoming, that opens it up for acceptance. And as we start to accept all parts of who we are, we start to create wealth in those areas of our life. I like to view wealth as what we start to receive, abundance and prosperity, right? I asked God, source, universe for the best possible husband that the universe could send me <clears throat> and the most amazing child in that relationship. And I received what I was um, opening up to and being able to receive because I started to forgive those parts that I didn't like about myself in the past and in past relationships. And I started to see myself on a deeper soul level, which is why acceptance is key. And I'm going to show you a quote on the next slide, but I want to point something out about acceptance. My friends, it is pivotal that in the acceptance process to let go of control. I have a sticky here and I'm gonna share it with you. If you don't let go of control, you're not gonna find your strength. So as you're releasing all of these different emotions physically and mentally and spiritually, <laughs> You start to let go of things that don't matter anymore. But what really matters is who you are at that deep level. And in that deep process in knowing and loving yourself at your core, you receive more things than ever before. And it truly is a beautiful process. And I want to share this with you all real quick. So this comes from the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, whether you're in program or not, um, you can negate the word alcoholism should you choose to do so. But acceptance is the answer. <laughs> and accepting all parts in, in who we are and where we're at and where we're becoming. So this is a page from the big book, like I said, on page 417, if you do have that book. And the quote as follows, and acceptance is the answer to all my problems today. When I'm disturbed, it is because I find some person, place, thing, or situation 
some face of my life unacceptable to me, right? Goes back to that piece around control. And I cannot find serenity until I accept that person, place, or thing, or situation as being exactly the way it is supposed to be in the moment. Nothing, absolutely nothing happens in God's world by mistake. You are not a mistake. You're supposed to be here. So until I accept my alcoholism or my drug addiction or the current situation in which I find myself, I cannot stay sober. Unless I accept life completely on life's terms, I cannot be happy. I need to concentrate not so much on the external and what needs to be changed in the world as what needs to be changed in me and my attitudes. The sun is hitting me at the, the most perfect time to click out of the presentation, y'all. Um, thank you so much for allowing me to share um, my story with you. And I see that there's questions in the chat and I'm gonna pass it back over to my friend, Emily. Hey, Brittany, thank you so much for presenting for us today and sharing your experience and your business. It's all super amazing. And we're super grateful for you being a part of our speaker series today. Um, so let's dive into the questions. Let's see here. So we have a question uh, from Jess and it says, it sounds like your CrossFit family became a huge support system, especially in the absence of family support. Do you have any other recommendations of where people can turn to for support? Absolutely. Um, so what I would ask you, Jess, is what lights you up? What makes you feel like you can get involved in to find that, that support? So recommendations, if you are um, on Facebook or you're on um, any sort of social platforms to start joining groups, get involved. Um, I know creating friends online for us adults has been really interesting. I know for me, it's been very, very interesting over the last couple of years of navigating like, well, who do I wanna be friends with and where do I find these people? Um, striking up conversations with random strangers has been one of the most profound things um, and beautiful things that I've, I've found. Um, other recommendations would be joining book clubs. Um, if you're not into the gym, like that's a perfect way to get started and, and finding support. If you're reading the same thing, it feels really not only intellectually beneficial, but you're learning about other people and um, getting to know them on a deeper level. And books do that. Intelligence does that for us. Um, other recommendations could be, you know, if you're into fitness or if you have a pet going out for dog walkings or if you have children joining um, mom or dad groups and just getting yourself out there. And if you're an introvert, um, I like to call myself an ambivert where I like my space, but I really thrive in a, in a group, but I'm exhausted after I leave. So I, I'm both introverted and extroverted. And if that's you, or if you're, you're introverted and you find, I don't know if I want to be around big groups. There are so many small circles, probably where you live, where other men and women are looking for that connection as well. So it's just a matter of you striking up that conversation and, and what feels good for you. I hope that helps. Yeah, thanks for answering that. And it's funny that you mentioned a book club. I have a colleague that started a book club in during this pandemic. And um, as far as from what I've heard, she's been loving it. So, um, and, you know, has made friends and things like that. So I agree with you. That's a great one. And um, joining a group is always super helpful. So, um, okay. Next question is, I love the vis visualization you did. I'm just barely familiar with meditation. Where can I start? 
Awesome question. Love this. And honestly, if you have a cell phone, best place to start is going on your apps, whether you have Android or you have an iPhone. Um, you can also go on YouTube, but on the phone, you have Headspace, Insight Timer, um, and a few other different apps that you can download. I have one called Insight Timer. It has live teachings and it's got meditations and yoga and people doing all kinds of different modalities to help you. And I love the visualization meditations, both live as well as recorded on there. Um, I heard Headspace is fantastic as well. There's often ads on TV about that one, um, but Insight Timer would be a great place to start. If you go on YouTube and you just type in guided visualization meditations, you will find millions of teachers. And, and to be honest with you, what I would say is find somebody that lights your heart up. You know, if you hear that voice and it's melodic and, and um, it, you get those chills all over your body, I would say that's your person. When I hear um, Brene Brown speak, I, I'm immediately, I'm, I'm leaning in. I'm like, what else is she going to say? How, you know, what else is there to hear? Um, that's one of my favorite authors and speakers. So who do you resonate with um, when you're starting this journey? And I, I do recommend visualization meditation before you start doing it on your own and you start um, a silent practice of meditation because that's where I'm at now, where it's more about what do I see in the silence? Um, so yeah, start, start there. I love that. Yeah. And I know for myself, it was like also just learning to sit with myself. So a guided meditation was so helpful and crucial in the beginning, um, to have someone kind of essentially talking in my ear and then, uh, and learning to sit with myself and, and really connect and then, um, you know, be able to dive into that meditative state. So, um, okay. Next question is how did adding CrossFit as a movement component help you in your recovery? Mm. Thank you for uh, asking this. So how did it add as a movement component? Can you expand on movement component. Um, what I'm gauging from this question is my, my body movement. Um, so <laughs> I started out very, very, very sluggish and, and, and slow. Um, so Anna saying, I think it means why does body movement help? Okay. Got it. Um, so body movement, you're moving, not just your physical body, you're, you're moving this, um, you're retraining the brain. You're allowing your mind to get behind the, the physical movement. Um, and where it helped me was in the first, I would say 90 days. Um, my body did not want to go to this gym. I was sore after the first workout. I couldn't work, walk. Um, but something inside of me said, keep going. And why that's important is because when we start to train our mind, our body, and our spirit, and they start to align, um, to the ways that we choose to do things. And we make that decision, um, everything seems to start to click. Right. And so why movement is important is it's, it's training you, it's training you to become who you want to be. And for me, it was that training process that was so pivotal in my recovery. Had I not had movement, I might have either relapsed um, or gone a different route. Maybe I did join a book club or, or maybe I found myself in AA and I wasn't moving my body, but because I'm a former athlete and playing ball was, was kind of my thing. Movement just seemed like the smart way to, to go um, for my personal recovery. And then the other thing I would say why this helps is because it's going to clear up a lot of that 
fog that's going on in your mind, right? I know in the beginning of recovery, it felt like everything was so busy up here and I was often told stories. So during movement, I wasn't thinking, I was just going and moving my body. Um, and that movement allowed me to actually go inward and, and find what it truly was that I needed um, during that time in my recovery process. It's funny, I, I relate to you so much. Um, <laughs> and um, I relate to that, like, you know, burning off that steam, unplugging, getting your body moving, getting those endorphins going. And ultimately, if you're feeling better from the inside out, you're going to, you know, feel your best, I, I think, personally. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Um, lastly, we have, you are so confident. I feel like I lack emotional resilience since I'm really struggling. How do I get into the permission process if I don't feel confident about it yet? Well, the first thing I would say is, um, confidence takes practice and you know, that old saying, fake it till you make it. Um, one of the, the things that I did was I would look at myself in the mirror every single day. And I just, uh, at first would say, hi, you know, hi, looking at myself was hard enough. Um, so just saying hi for, for like the first 30 days. And then I would catch myself in the mirror and I'd say, oh, you look good today. And I'd like sprint out of the room. <laughs> because it was scary. Um, it was super scary to do that. And now when I look in the mirror, I tell myself, I love myself and I look great today and your hair looks fantastic. And I have all these sticky notes on my mirror that say like, I love your smile. I love your curves. I have my own paparazzi on my bathroom mirror. And so what I would say in order to get started in the process, is feeding yourself those, those good words, taking the, the honey and allowing that honey to, to take over your body. Um, when you get sick, my aunt used to just shove that honey in, in my mouth and be like, you're cured, everything's great. You don't have your cough anymore, um, which probably wasn't the best, um, but you know, when, when it start when you start to learn how to build confidence, you start with the words. So I would say not so much words of affirmation. Um, that's a whole nother topic I could talk on and how that doesn't actually work, but get yourself some of these stickies and, um, start writing words, you know, what word lights you up? And if it's confidence, if it's happiness, if it's excitement, what brings you the most joy? So when you start in the process, um, start with the words. And then when it comes to setting an intention, allowing those words to take you somewhere else, out of here. I feel like in, in recovery, early recovery, even now, eight years into this, sometimes we're here. Right, Emily, I'm sure you can relate to yeah. this and I can probably relate to this. And those of you watching, we're here. So how do we drop from here to here into this big old missing piece is we feed ourselves that medicine. So feed yourself the words, feed yourself that love because you deserve it. Um, I didn't get here without practice. Um, you gotta practice. Practice makes not perfect, we don't wanna go there, but it makes us better people and, and better moms and fathers and sisters and brothers and, and better people in this world. And that's what we need. You're so right. And um, I like what you said about, you know, practice makes us better, right? Um, perfect is a really high standard to try and live up to, uh, but better is super encouraging, I think. Um, and I think I also was once told, you know, if I, if I can't feed that to myself in that moment, then try and help someone else 
Mm. you know, and, and reach a hand out. And in turn, I will feel better. And it's true. I've done it time and time again. And, um, you know, it fills me up to just help someone else or, or get out of, you know, like you said, get out of here and uh, listen, even just be a listening ear to someone else. So anyways, all right. Well, um, I think that about wraps up our questions as of right now. Um, thank you all for participating and um, asking questions to Brittany. And Brittany, again, thank you for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate it. And we will have this live on YouTube tomorrow to watch on demand. And should anyone else have any questions, we will make sure that um, we get back to you and also pass them along to Brittany. So thanks again, guys. And thank you, Brittany. I hope you have a wonderful rest thank of your you. evening. Thank you, ladies. And thank you to everybody who did ask questions and um, was here to be part of this. Thank you so much. Of course. Have a wonderful night. Thanks.